Welcome to ATA 204, where we're talking about the best paint polishing machines. Now in this episode, Kevin and I put two LED lights in a foam pad, then connect that foam pad to four different machines, meaning a rotary, DA, forced or gear driven, and then a large stroke, then put it on a piece of glass and turned it on. So you can see what the machine is actually doing. It's eye opening, it's a lot of fun, so I think you're gonna enjoy it. Number two, a lot of you have asked about the ATA 100 series or the beginner series. That's on my website on the training. Click the training button, and you'll see uh, uh, beginner, and then you see intermediate, which is what we're working on now, and then podcast. A lot of you have asked, where are the podcasts? The podcasts are on that page, and I'm coming out with a whole new series of podcasts, so stay tuned for that. Now, jumping back to episode 203, uh, which is the top five mistakes when polishing, specifically unclean paint. There is a huge question, it's all over the internet, and I asked Kevin to respond to it, and I would read it on camera to kind of dispel any confusion. So when you have unclean paint, meaning something that's invisible on the paint and you can't see it, you don't know what's there, and you're polishing and it's not working out, right? I'll also post a link of Kevin and I doing, uh, with Derek Bemis, a, uh, you know, a Barry Maguire's 4GT, and we talk about it a lot there, so check that link out. So basically, how do you approach it? Do you have, you have one approach, which is to chemically shock the paint, meaning hit it with acids and solvents and very strong cleaners, or option two is doing a thing called the mow down technique. So here's his response to the chemical. He says, hey guys, it's important to realize that if a cleaning product has the ability to strip, dissolve, or somehow remove that durable protective layer, it also has the potential to simultaneously cause damage to the paint by microscopically dissolving or etching it, or drying via oxidation the uppermost portion of the paint's surface. Furthermore, repeated applications of the paint cleaning solutions that we talked about here can cause paint to swell, become spongy and twisty and react differently to polishing in the future. He goes on to say, instead of using those super strong and potentially damaging detergents or acids to clean the paint, you simply use more buffing liquid on a separate pad to do a mow down of the affected area, clean the pad and then move on. So basically what he's saying is a mow down is you add a lot more product on, the, on let's say a microfiber cutting pad, you polish it out. Your goal is to actually embed all of that invisible um, layer of unclean paint into that pad, rip it off, put it to the side, grab a new pad, and then do, do your normal, you know, prime the pad, do your normal polishing. Now you're actually touching the clear coat. So that was the point that was trying to be made. Like, hey, if we're doing all this stripping, there's a big craze of stripping the paint. We're gonna talk about, we have a whole other video diving deep into the history of why we're stripping and why maybe we shouldn't strip it anymore. Um, you want to be careful because there's some downsides to it. So that's kind of the point. We're going to have more discussion about it, but I hope that clears it up. Now on to episode 204. Next, we'll be focusing on paint polishing machines and how they advanced over the years along with paint technology. To do that, we're gonna be focusing on four different categories of polishers, the most popular ones. Of course, we have rotary over here, we have random orbit, gear driven, and large stroke. But I will say this a bit of a disclaimer. The first machine that we've ever used, of course, is our arm, our shoulder, our hands going back and forth. Um, but over the years, oh, that didn't work out too well. Yeah. So. Thankfully, we came up with machines. So give me a little bit of a uh, background and sort of the benefits and drawbacks, the strengths or weaknesses of the rotary polisher. Well, when you pick one up, first thing you notice when you hit the throttle, it feels really smooth. You know, it feels like, hey, that's nice. When you put it on the paint though, and if you haven't used one in the past, you're gonna notice right away it right. pulls. And then if you have a curved panel versus like, a yeah, straight- Yeah, like these little spots yeah, here. Or you tilt the machine, it will actually, it's kind of running away from you. It will, it will, yeah, it will, just like a tire and wheel, it will travel in a direction depending on how you steer it. Not that easy to control one hand, so, and this, a lot of torque, uh, a lot of weight, and that, for that reason, it's good to have a, a side a handle or a side handle. You, you really kind of need it. Right. Variable speed, okay? And one thing about that is you'll, not, you'll notice with every machine that as you add speed, the pad starts to glide along and it's easier to control. Right. These are strategic too, that's a big advantage. I can put a one inch pad, a nine inch pad and everything in between and this machine can uh, remain comfortable to use and, and utilize that pad in various situations. And, and get into smaller areas yeah. as well, you can get into tight spots. Right, now one of the things that, why these are so scary and, and a lot of people don't use a rotary is because they can create a lot of polishing energy, uh, the weight 
and you tilt. Now when you tilt, all of this torque and weight and any force is now, instead of being in a large area, it's now focused right here. Right. That's where we get, we cause rapid paint removal, we cause burning damage. And finally, on edges, they really grab and they can tear your buffing pad, they can burn the edge, they can actually hurt you, right. <laughs> knock, it, knock it into your body. So the, the benefits and, and drawbacks are immense in terms of being able to learn how to use one and actually use one, uh, but technology has given us other machines to use as well. Right. Okay, so for our test, we're going to be putting the pad that you've designed here, the LED pad, uh -huh. on our rotary, and we're going to put it on the glass. Now, we're going to be doing this for every single machine. Right. So describe what's going to be going on You're here. You're going to be running through the different speeds, do a little tilt to see if it affects the, uh, the, the pattern that the machine creates and kind of watch what the pad does too. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, the idea yeah. here is if you're watching at home, you're thinking, okay, what is the pad doing to the paint? Because I can't obviously see what's going on right now if, if this was a, a, you know, a car. Right. What's it actually doing to try to you know, yeah. get that in your mind as we go it's, through it's the categories? It's going to be much easier to understand the motions versus us trying to draw them Exactly, out. exactly. So here we go. Already you can see pure, straight, just constant circular motion. Right. Bump the speed up. There we go. All right, looking good. Do a little tilt left to right. Just a little left, a little right. Great. There you go. So what is this telling us right now? That the machine motion is constant in the same direction and it doesn't deviate. It's just rotational circular only. Wow. And this isn't a big deal to see on a rotary, but as we progress through the different machines, you'll see the different designs and shapes that they create. Okay, for category number two, we're talking about random orbitals. Yes. So before we get started there, there is a category called orbitals, but we don't really use it in the detailing world. Explain. We do very limited. Right. Yeah. This, this is about the size of the typical orbital pad or it, in our industry, it's right. for sanding primarily, and it's designed to strategically remove a dirt nib. So for a momentary, you know, for a second or two, machine comes down, bzz, knocks off a dirt nib or you know a piece of dirt that's stuck in the paint. Right. Uh, already there's contamination on the little disc. Throw it away and start again. So it's very so, isolated, usually like body shop kind of thing. Yeah. So it's not really yeah. not really polishing the entire car. Right. Of. It's highly efficient for very strategic sanding only. Okay. Uh, after that, if you wanted to get any polishing action and use it for polishing, you would have to uh, add in motion, the orbital action, by moving your hand around a lot. And so, that would be the random part of it? Yeah, that, that's mimicking what a random orbital does for you automatically. Right. All right. So hop into the random orbital. Yeah. What, what would be the strengths, the weaknesses? Okay. Well, first, let's talk about that action, which orbital action. It just orbits around. Right. But the random part is that the whole backing plate and pad can rotate in either direction as well or not at all. So the orbit is mechanically driven, okay? And this is driven by dynamic forces. So the friction. orbital was just doing side to side kind of short. Yeah, just this one is doing side to side and it's if orbiting, I could twist my hand, the hand. It, exactly. Right, okay. So lightweight, Good. very versatile because it's easy to put on three inch backing plate, five inch backing plate, six inch backing plate. Um, you can compound with the pads, polish, you can remove, wa apply wax and remove wax actually. So they're very versatile. Right. So. The thing I like to talk about or, or think about is when there were rotaries or the staple, I mean, just the forever. And then when they made this leap to this random orbit, I mean, the gap between rotary and random orbit was just yeah. phenomenal. I mean, it changed the industry. Yeah, technology has been focused on the random orbital or, orbital or dual action machines. Right, and okay. then making large stroke, gear, you know, all yeah. these little changes in there. Yeah. But from rotary to orbit, it was just a massive leap. Like, oh because my gosh. Because the, the average person can pick one up, turn it on and easily control it. Yeah. It's got a lot of control. It's not running away from you. Right, it's not fighting you and dragging you around. Right. Lower torque or lower, lower, lower power motors, mm -hmm. um, get on an edge, still smooth. Go right off, right off of the edge, it's still smooth. Okay, bump speed up. You can still do all the things that you do with a, a rotary. You can tilt a little bit, but you see that action as depending on angle and they still have a capability of remo removing a tremendous amount of paint rapidly but uh, by and large you'd have to be sitting there you have a little more time to, to make the adjustment to get yourself out of trouble versus something like the rotary which could would dig in right there and grab 
Okay, so let's pick up our LED pad and yeah. go through the same process like we're going to do for everything else so we can see what's actually going on. Yeah, it's much, it's much more accurate and easier to see that than us trying to draw it out on a piece of paper. Of course. So here we have our two lights again. Put it on. I'm on the lowest setting. Yep. Here we go. Can we see it? There we go. All right. There you go. You see the little circles? The LED? That is the 8 millimeter orbit that that machine creates. That's the orbit action. Now, you've got some friction between the pad and the glass there, so bump it. There you go. Now look at that change already. The shape's changing. Bump speed up. Kind of give it a little shift to the left, a little shift to the right. Move it around and constantly shifting the direction and the shape that that LED traveling in. A little more speed. Look at that. Pointing. It's kind of curvy. It's pointing now. Yeah, it's curvy. Great. Very dynamic, constantly shifting, constantly changing. Hard for a particle to stay in place. So if something does stick, it eventually gets knocked out, rolled around, recrushed, reused, distributed, spread around. And that's why these things work so well for rapid cut, long cutting. And then, you know, uh, when you're ready to finish down, it can be very finesse, fin you know, finesse and right. smooth and, and delicate at the same time. So okay. very versatile. So on to the next one, gear driven. That was the next leap in technology, so to speak. What can you say from a you know, strength, weakness per perspective? Well, they, they, ha they came out at a point in which we were in the midst of this was dominating. Right. This was not quite yet uh, optimized for its performance. You know, we were using basically rotary pads on these machines, and they were big and tall and fluffy and large diameter, and they just couldn't deliver that kind of performance you needed. Enter in the forced rotation or, or, or gear-driven orbital action, which gives you a constant, uh, still dual actions, but they're, they're both constant, they're both gear-driven. Would you say in another way, it's kind of the combination or the hybrid of the two of them? I would say that be pretty accurate. So it's got the power and the strength, let's call it, yes. of the rotary. It's got that it constant torque that, and drive. Yeah, there you so go. So you're getting a motion, uh, not, not exactly the same, but a constant rotation but then there's a pattern woven into that too and it could be more of a star pattern or a wiggly pattern but it remains constant you get a lot of the benefits and the negatives of both machines so you still can do one-handed on this right. you see that where i couldn't on this that easy to walk away now you see it wobble a tiny bit but very safe there still safe you right see? but is it going to stall like not the no, this will never stall. That that will stay constant. Even on speed one, we're getting rotation and orbit action. Not going to stall. And I'm pushing down. Right. Okay. So, um, and again, a lot of what this machine does in terms of why isn't it grabbing and stalling and why isn't it tearing into the paint is because you're getting it's constantly shifting the pad direction where the rotary, it's focused in one direction and you push down, it really digs in. This one can't dig in because it's being moved around all the time. Mm -hmm. So when you, you understand what I'm saying there? Right. That's one of the huge benefits of uh, orbital action is that it's hard for it to get in and stay in one place and dig in and bury itself. Right. It's constantly trying to, it's like if you're, if you're in, if you're off-roading and you're in sand or mud, if you just hold your tire straight and you go into and you start dropping in, you're right. If you don't steer the wheels and all that and give it a little throttling gas and change up, you know, the way it's driving, you're gonna you're gonna sink. But if you do that and you're shifting left and you're shifting right and the tires are weaving and bobbing, there's less chance of you digging in and, and burying yourself. So in, in our realm, it's less chance of causing that heavy damage yeah, or concentrating right. everything right there. So you still got kind of get the strength, but you. And you increase the safety and you sort you of take away a bit of that danger of what you're talking about, digging the sure, wheels in. Sure, sure. And it's equally capable of cutting rapidly or delicately. And so when we switch pads and, and, and put it on the, the machine over here, the gear driven, what are we going to see? You're going to see a constant pattern. Now you, you may have a, a half dozen different brands of machine that are in the uh, forced rotation orbital or gear driven. They all have their own little nuances of how they design their, their, their movement, mm -hmm. but it's going to remain constant. Okay, so let's give this one a shot. Okay. Again, we got the same exact pad we've been using on the rotary and the random orbit. Two lights, put it on the glass. And the first thing I notice is it, it feels like it's going in the opposite it, direction. In this particular machine, it, it's a reverse rotation compared to all the other machines up on the table. 
Okay, so describe what's going on here. You're seeing the two LEDs and you're gonna see a constant pattern. And it's very similar. It's, it's virtually identical in, inward and outward. Bump the speed up a little bit. That'll get it to be a little smoother. You can go a little higher. There you go. Now hold it as still as you can. Look at the machine and just hold it still. And even if you move it up and down and left and right, pattern, the LED pattern is staying the same. Yeah. Good. Even if I tilt it, it's, it's keeping yeah. the same pattern. That's right. So this thing is pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's uh, got a lot of fans and it, what they like about it, it gives you th a lot of the benefits of both the rotary and the dual action random orbital. So uh, if something bogs down. If that's a bothersome thing for you, right. then this is, this is the type of machine you should try out and see if, that, if, if this is ideal for you. Right, so, just powers right through it. Uh-huh, yep. Okay, so now the most popular ones, the most exciting ones right now today are the large stroke. Tell me a little bit about what's it, going on there. Yeah, it, it delivers just immense performance. It's still a random orbital or a dual action machine, but they've taken the orbit size and made it bigger. So yeah, three things going on uh, that, that kind of consist of the three main reasons why there's lots of hype around this. So uh, the first one is the uh, increase in defect removal rate. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's an improvement on the finishing side of things. And, uh, and then there's something going on with the pad in terms of cleaning. So those three things uh, contribute to what, you know, what's this the big deal about. The craziness about them, yeah. got it, okay. So let's uh, dive into what the orbit's actually doing here. If you look at the uh, orbital pattern, sure. so we're looking at this, which is the actual orbit size. So standard in the industry for many years has been eight millimeter, but let's look at 21. And if you kind of analyze this and look at what's going on with the orbit, um, Take this eight millimeter orbit, and you take this circle and you straighten it out, make you it unravel linear, it, make it linear. Yep. Yes, so you'll you'll see a kind of a line like that, and then the 21. If you take that line, it's a lot longer, right? Yeah. You know that orbit would be a lot longer. So what's happening here is your orbits are happening in the same time frame. So if you compared an eight millimeter to a 21 millimeter, it's making that complete circle in the same amount of time, but the 21 is going a further distance. So more work is being done, is that a fair yeah, statement? Yeah, exactly. In fact, about three times more work is being done. Certainly if you were waxing the car, you could right. use tight little circles. You could do that, take you a long time to get some work done. Why couldn't we just do this? Well, we can. Now, if you have to be in the woodworking industry and you try to use this type of orbit and try to get inside of a box, you're gonna bash the side, bash, bash, bash. Right. Not only that, you can't get into this area, okay? So, so the short, shorter stroke or small stroke machines are ideal for strategic polishing. If like, I want to get, like this, like rotary. Yeah, if I want to get right here on the side of this right. and I want to focus all my polishing, a short stroke, small diameter pad would be great for that. But we have hoods and roofs and trunks and big doors and so we can get the huge benefit of r rapidity of cut and that, mm -hmm. that's interesting too because when I, when we say you know, rate of cut or this one cuts quickly it also finishes quickly right so if i if it takes 10 of these but two of these it's a lot faster you mm -hmm. just do two of these you don't have to do 10 of these and cut more paint you're just cutting more paint quickly right so okay. give it a whirl yep so, and so what does it feel like to someone who's well, a beginner? What, what you're going to notice with the large stroke is you're going to think massive stroke, big throw, a lot of power. So you're going to think, I'm going to really grip this thing because it's going to be out of control. It's the opposite because as you increase stroke, you have to increase counterweight. It's like if you had a tennis ball and a string and I said, Larry, I want you to take this tennis ball and string and spin it above your head, but let some string out every time you go and yes, keep so that rate, yeah. man, that's going to get leverage on you. Pretty soon you're going to be getting pulled off center, right? right? Same kind of idea. So as you increase stroke or orbit diameter, they have to add counterweight and it becomes very critical, the balance, and you notice it because when you fire one up, they're so smooth. I mean, they're just right. incredibly smooth. So you, so you're getting all the benefits of the, the shorter stroke machine, but it works getting done a lot more quickly. And do you notice that motor speed? I can drop the motor speed, but I've still got a lot of velocity of the pad motion. So I can be very comfortable and get a lot of work done. And yeah, you can still get the stalling effect, but it's not 
such a critical thing because you've got such a big orbit, you're still getting a lot of motion. So even if that pad stalls for a second or two or three seconds, it's still giving you a tremendous amount of motion. Right. Look at that. Yeah. Huge. I could stall for five or six seconds and I'm still going to have good migration of my abrasives, compounds, polishes. All right. So let's put this on. We have a cordless version. Nice. Yeah. Of a, uh, and that's a little shorter or smaller stroke. This, so this is 21, 21 millimeter is orbit. That's a 15. Okay. So this as it's going, it's going 21. We're doing 15. Right. Right. Yep. All right. So two lights, same thing, putting it on. We have it on the lowest setting. There you go. Much bigger. If you remember the, the earlier. The, right. On the random yeah. orbit. That is uh, about twice the size of the orbit. Still same kind of motion. Now let's play around a little bit. Give it a little tilt, a little speed. And let's see if we can, there you go. There you go. Now just tilt, move up and down. Look at it change, constant. Left, right, tilt left, tilt right. Bump the speed up. Look at that, huge difference. Wow. Excellent. That really shows you the dynamics of constantly rubbing in every different direction, moves things around. All right, so let's do a bit of a recap here, starting from the, the rotary strengths and weakness, weaknesses. Uh, it's so lots of power, lots of torque. You can be very strategic with it depending on the size of the pad or how much you tilt. Right, you so like also... one of your examples that you were talking about before was working in, let's say a draw right here, you know, like a in a corner in or a corner drawer. of it, yeah mm -hmm. so the rotary is just going to stay there and it's going to stay on a fixed yeah. axle right yep and just right where something like a large orbit is going to karate chop da, 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 yeah, da, da, I da, come da, in right here and get right to the edge oh right right in here yeah and stay there right unlike if you were using this one you you put it here and it's going to bang 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 it, bang, bang you know, it's or it's chop. only going to polish part of the time right as it as it comes around you can get strategic too but you have to remember, it's only going to come there part of the time. Right. Oh, I get what you're saying. So that outer ring on a random orbital is not getting as efficiently polished or not getting polished all the time as the center. Right. Follow? So the oh, stroke right. ring, you know, the outer perimeter. Where a rotary is 100% of the time, wherever it is you put it. Yeah. This, because this it's, one, because it's, it's like, random, you're catching it every yeah, third time. We'd get whatever. the same effect with a rotary if we took the pad and we had it, we had it off center a little bit. It would wobble too, right? If that was not centered and I turned on the machine, it would wobble too. Oh, I get it. You follow? Yeah. So. Okay. All right, so now with the orbitals, we made it a lot easier, a lot safer, lighter. Uh, anyone, you know, the garage, the weekend warrior, whatever you want to call yep. it. It's not it intimidating, very easy to pick it up, put on a variety of pads, use it with a variety of liquids and get a pretty good result. Right, and it stalls giving you what would, you know, would be a safety, a margin of it, safety. It's safe and it's comfortable, right? Right, Because you come over an edge and it's not steering you around. It, it's stalling for a reason. It helps keep that in control. Yeah. Right. Then we bumped up to the gear driven. So we said, okay, we have the rotary, we have the orbital. Let's kind of smack them together, have a hybrid type thing where mm -hmm. instead of the stall, right, we're going to blast through that stall. But at the same time, we're going to give it a random orbit so that it's less likely to burn through. That's right. And keep in mind that at the time when those were becoming very popular, it was, it was a great transition between the tried and true decades old rotary with the, hey, this is interesting random orbital, but I don't have the right pads yet for it. So it would stall a lot and buzz right. a lot. That was a great uh, choice. To, to give you the best performance of both of those. Of course. Then we moved all the way up to the big boys, the 15 millimeter and the 20 millimeter large stroke. And now that, that stroke is getting a lot more work done within the category of yes, you know, these random orbits. The, the higher quality machines are very well balanced, very well built, and they're comfortable to use, uh, extremely capable in cutting and finishing potential. Uh, even a beginner could start with one and say, wow, I'm great at this. Matter of fact, uh, on my best day, when I first started using the large stroke, sure. I would say, wow, how can I compare this? I could say, well, on my best day with all the best equipment, everything I know with this machine, um, I could mimic that performance with that machine and do it in half the time. Or if I use two pads and two liquids with this one, I could do it with one pad and one liquid with that one. They're so efficient and good at what they do. And I think, as the technology is going, the latest thing as of today, the, the, you know, this shooting, you know, this filming here is, now we yeah. have cordless, yeah. which is yeah. pretty amazing. Cordless. Yeah, everything is, 
is moving into the cordless realm. So I'm pretty excited for what's going to come out. I don't know what's going to come out next, but yeah. it seems to be uh, going quite well. So the bottom line is this. I think you would agree. There is no There's, best polisher by any means. What is your goal? Which one do you like to use? How much time do you have? And, and that dictates which one you should pick up and, and, and utilize in that situation. Because you could certainly cut away paint rapidly with any of these and you could finish out paint beautifully with any of these. So on the next episode, we're gonna be talking about pads, liquids, yep. and how they're interacting, what else? It's the most exciting segment for me because it's, it's, it can completely transform performance on one, on one given machine. Right, yeah. so of course, if you have any questions, shoot me an email at larry at ammonyc.com. Click on the link above, you can watch all the episodes uh, that we just already shot, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Mm -hmm.